thank you for joining us. I'm Wendy Echeverria Garcia, a second year student at the University of Oregon, majoring in Latin American Studies and Indigenous Race and Ethnic Studies, and minoring in Spanish and Latinx Studies, as well as pursuing a Certificate in Educational Foundation Secondary. Good to see you, Wendy. And nice to see you too, Cheryl. Welcome to Almuerzo y Arte, part two. I'm Cheryl Hartup, Curator of Academic Programs in Latin American and Caribbean Art at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art at University of Oregon. For the past six months, Cheryl and I have been working together on an exhibition of 20th century prints called Nuestra Imagen Actual, our present image, Mexico and the Graphic Arts of 1929 to 1956. You can experience the exhibition in person at the JSMA on UO's campus and virtually on the museum's website, jsma.uoregon.edu. Before we start our conversation, we would like to acknowledge and honor the land that we were on and its history. Our program is being held on the traditional lands of the Multnomah, Wasco, Cowlitz, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Bands of Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Malala, and the many other tribes who made their homes along the Columbia and Willamette rivers. We pay respect and thank the indigenous people for being the original stewards and protectors of these lands. We give gratitude for their continued work and we acknowledge their enduring perseverance and resilience across generations. This calls us to commit to continuing to learn how to be better stewards of the land that we inhabit and to understand and challenge the past and current practices of colonialism in the communities we call home. This is our second public program for Nuestra Imagen Actual, and I've enjoyed working with you on this exhibition, which is co-organized by the Jordan Center Museum of Art and the Portland Art Museum. Support was provided by Art Bridges and by members and donors to the JSMA. I've enjoyed working with you too, Wendy, as well as Mary Weaver Chapin, curator of prints and drawings at the Portland Art Museum. Mary and the staff at PAM have been very generous and supportive of the project, lending 50 prints to the exhibition. In fact, it was Portland Art Museum's impressive holdings of Mexican prints that inspired the exhibition. I can't wait to see um, this project on view at PAM in the future. I also want to express our gratitude to Seattle Art Museum and Dr. Lee Rabbits of Seattle Cecily Quintana and Quintana Galleries in Portland, and UO Library's Special Collections for lending important works from their collections to the show. I thought we could talk about a few prints in the exhibition that address the Mexican Revolution from 1910 to 1920. That sounds good. That's how we started the exhibition. The Mexican Revolution was the first social revolution of the 20th century, and it was big international news. During the decades of national rebuilding, artists in Mexico often romanticized martyrs like the revolutionary leader and land reform champion Emiliano Zapata, who was murdered in 1919, a victim of the revolution's internal struggles. Artists also idealized the women who took up arms. These iconic images by Diego Rivera and Jesus Escobedo helped institutionalize the Mexican revolution which in the words of writer Earl Shores, quote, had the power of faith and the durability of dogma, end quote. La Revolucionaria by Jesus Escobedo is one of my favorite works. What were some of the crucial roles women uh, occupied during the Mexican Revolution? Well, women were writers of radical feminist literature and political platforms. Dressed as men and as women, they fought alongside rebel or federal forces and some had the rank of coronel. Women and scavenged for food and water, prepared meals, cleaned weapons and clothes, cared for the wounded and children and buried the dead. Some volunteered to join the troops, others were kidnapped, raped and abused. I've heard some of the popular revolutionary corridos or ballads like La Delita and La Valentina. They don't mention these women's roles in combat only their beauty and emotions as the objects of male desire. I read that soldaderas were controversial during the revolution. After the fighting stopped, the new government re-emphasized that they only fulfilled domestic roles during battle 
tasks that they would have performed in their own homes had they not been following the troops. By reducing the actual importance of the soldaderas and eliminating the fact that many of them had fought and led troops, the government could reduce the already insignificant amount of aid awarded to female veterans and exclude them from history. And Chicanx artists in the 1960s gravitated to images of Mexican revolutionary heroes, both male and female, in the photographic archives of Agustin Victor Casasola and family, and used them for their silkscreen prints and murals during the Chicano movement. I love how in this mural, a women revolutionary is leading Emiliano Zapata, Pancho Villa, and Chicano and African American civil rights leaders. This is another great image that you found on the internet. Yes, photographer Jorge Rodriguez documents how the image of the armed women fighter was particularly important for Chicanas as they struggled for equity and inclusion in El Movimiento. A print featuring the Re Mexican revolutionary leader Emiliano Zapata is behind this Adelita de Aslan. Aslan meaning the mythical Aztec homeland that extends from northern Mexico up into the west coast and southwest of North America. Do you want to add another print that relates to Jesus Escobedo's La Revolucionaria that you're familiar with? Yes, Luna Llena is a silkscreen print by Chicana Esther Hernandez. Students at the Latinx Scholars Community at UL voted that the JSMA acquire this work for its permanent collection. It's on view now next to Nuestra Imagen Actual. Here, a campesina carries a rifle and hoe. She may be a member of the Indigenous Self-Defense Patrol in a remote village in Southern Mexico or Central America. The Aztec moon goddess represented on the bright disc behind the campesina lights her path. Jose Clemente Orozco's lithograph, Rear Guard from 1929, focuses not on the heroes of the Mexican Revolution, but on the dark huddled masses that trudge onward. They personify endurance in the midst of extreme hardship. The artist uses areas of bright white to draw our eyes across the work and to distinguish three vulnerable figures. In the top left is a young boy on the shoulders of a soldier. Along the right edge is a young woman holding a basket. In the center, a woman tenderly caresses the foot of the baby strapped to her back. Perhaps these three youthful figures in white symbolize hope for a better life for future generations. What does your version of the rear guard look like in 2020, Wendy? I want to compare Orozco's rear guard to a photograph of one of the feminist marches in Santiago, Chile. I admire how graphic and powerful these women demonstrations are. On the stomach of the woman in the front, it reads, quote, of el violador eres tu, mean, end quote, meaning the rapist is you. I selected this particular image because two women have their eyes covered and their faces are in shadow. Similarly, we can't see the faces of the women in Orozco's rear guard because he presents them with their backs to the viewer. To, the viewer. to me, this represents how in La Revolución, the innocent victims of femicide remain unknown and are not part of history. Like Rear Guard, many of the images and stories of women per participating in the Mexican Revolution are, are men, are made and told by men through a machista lens that distorts the legacy of women. Thank you for sharing that image, Wendy. Orozco witnessed the horrors of the revolution he saw the best and the worst in individuals, physical and moral pain and carnage. His firsthand experiences would forever mark his work and his feelings about humanity. In his autobiography, he said of the revolution, quote, the world was torn apart around us, troop convoys passed on their way to slaughter. Trains back from the battlefield unloaded their cargoes in the station in Orizaba, the wounded, the tired, exhausted, mutilated soldiers, unquote. Orozco's style and tone changed from a more sympathetic view in rear guard from 1929 to satire and caricature in Zapatistas from 1935. During the Mexican Revolution, 
where forces divided again and again and turned against each other. Orozco made a series of drawings and political cartoons for various newspapers, criticizing all sides of the fighting. In Zapatistas, Emiliano Zapata, a landowner turned revolutionary, is sidelined on the left, looking out over a sea of followers. Zapata formed and led the Liberation Army of the South, which fought for land and liberty. Is Orozco saying that the demands of the people were too great for any leader? Mexican writers often state that a million or more died in the revolution, many not really knowing why or for what. In Zapatistas, an unending surging mass takes on a life of its own, propelled by momentum, while the theatrical leaders don't quite know what to make of their precarious reality. In Diego Rivera's lithograph Zapata, printed in New York City in 1932, Emiliano Zapata is front and center, a leader, a hero, a martyr, a Christ-like figure. He is dressed not as he dressed in real life, but like his followers, to symbolize his solidarity with them. The men behind Zapata have determined expressions, but they look like saints compared to the hardened faces of Orozco's Zapatistas. Unlike Orozco, who saw the revolution firsthand, Rivera read about the Mexican Revolution in the newspapers in France. Rivera's print is based on two frescoes he painted, one in Cuernavaca, Mexico, and the other in New York City. The artist presents Zapata stepping on a, on a defeated colonizer of the past, a sword-wielding Spanish conquistador. It is clear Rivera is a proponent of Mexico's cultural revolution, which emphasized building the nation's future on the foundation of its indigenous past and present and not on its ties to Europe. Zapata's forces from Morelos, Mexico and Southern Mexico were displaced farmers and sugar cane cutters fighting for land reform. As we see in the print, their weapons are farm tools. Zapata is famous for saying, quote, if there is no justice for the people, may there not be peace for the government, end quote. The dichotomy of oppressed and oppressor is a prevalent subject in most of the prints in the exhibition. Let's end with Calavera Symphony Concert by Leopoldo Mendez. It's a wood engraving, and it first appeared in 1934 on the cover of the inaugural issue of Frente al Frente, the journal of the League of Revolutionary Writers and Artists. Men Mendez was a member of that group. The journal's title refers to the concept of class against class which Mendes makes plain in his scornful critique of two large well-to-do figures with ties to capitalist and fascist interests because of the dollar sign and swastika on the backs of their chairs. Mendes' use of skeletons or calavera pays in hom homage to the legacy of Jose Guadalupe Posada, the father of Mexican printing, who dramatized the nation's social ills through lively skeletons for a largely illiterate public. His skeletons remind the viewer that rich or poor, powerful or powerless, we all come to the same fate. In death, we are all equal. The setting for the print is the opening of the luxurious Palace of Fine Arts in Mexico City, while the playbill on the floor announces a concert of proletarian ballads the price of admission is well beyond what the working class can afford. In the lower right corner, two smaller skeletons um, in modest clothes are being run out of the concert hall by the armed guard. In other words, we like your music, but we despise you. To me, Nuestra Imagen Actual, our present image definitely resonates with our current times. Thank you, Wendy, for your work on the exhibition. I appreciate you sharing your thoughts and insights on many of the prints and artists in the show. I've learned a lot from you and I look forward to seeing you on campus again. I've enjoyed our time together today. Thank you, Cheryl. If you would like to watch a demonstration of the relief printmaking process, which was used by Leopoldo Mendes for Concierto Sinófico de Calaveras or the lithography process used by Rivera, Escobedo and Orozco, the following videos produced by the Museum of Modern Art in New York City were suggested by our partner, Mary Weaver Chapin, curator of prints and drawings at the 
Portland Art Museum. Thank you for joining us for Almuerzo Yarte.